Hey everybody, Mr. Marek here. Let us work through the first part of the analyzing simple harmonic motion assignment together. Uh, first, let's take this um, situation described on the first page and let's actually go back to the lab and kind of take a quick peek at what we're talking about. So here is an object on a vertical spring. Um, the spring is stretched a little bit because the weight is pulling it down. If you displace it down a little bit from its equilibrium position, now the spring is exerting more force than gravity and it's going to go up. If it's displaced above its equilibrium position, the spring exerts less force than gravity, so it goes down. So the first thing we have to realize is that as the spring, or as the mass oscillates, the spring due to the force is going to change because the spring is the force due to the spring is proportional to its stretch. And so when it's below equilibrium, the spring force is larger. When it's above equilibrium, the gravitational force is larger. Now remember that the gravitational force doesn't change, it's just the spring force that's changing as the spring stretches more and more. Okay, so on the first page, You like my fancy tripod set up here. Um, recall that the spring's force is proportional to its stretch, or x. So the further away from equilibrium it is stretched, the bigger the force. Um, and we have an equation for that. Spring force is equal to kx, where k is the spring constant, x is the amount of stretch. So in our free body diagrams, when the object is below equilibrium, then the spring force should be really, really big. When it's at equilibrium, like in the third picture, the two should be equal to each other. And then when it's above equilibrium, the spring force should be small. You might think that it would be zero at that point, but it's not likely to be zero. It could possibly be zero, but if it's zero, then what's likely to happen is that this thing is just gonna bounce off the spring. It's not gonna be moving in simple harmonic motion. Um, when it's at its lowest position, I would say that it's got no gravitational potential energy. I'd make that height be zero. As it moves up, the gravitational potential energy would get larger, even larger, even larger. And as it moves up, the spring potential energy would get smaller. So here it's the strength, the spring is stretched the most. I have a large spring potential energy, smaller, smaller, and then very small. Remember, we can decide where zero is, so for the sake of simplicity, I would make this be zero spring potential energy. If you still have a little bitty bar there, that's okay as well. The next thing we need to realize is that at its maximum displacement, the object is not moving. And so its kinetic energy would be zero. As it goes towards equilibrium, it speeds up due to those unbalanced forces and the loss of potential energy. And so the kinetic energy will be eh, medium size here, and then it'll be relatively large here. So when we do these velocities, the velocity at its amplitude, its maximum displacement, is always going to be zero. Then it's going to start moving up. When it reaches equilibrium, it'll be moving upwards really, really fast. So velocity is still going to be up. And then when we get back to equilibrium, this is the position where it's going to stop again. Velocity will be equal to zero. Remember that the acceleration of an object is going to be proportional to the force on it. So whatever direction the net force is, that's the direction of the acceleration. So when you pull this thing below equilibrium, the spring is going to try to pull it back towards equilibrium. So this thing is going to accelerate upwards. Right here, it's still below equilibrium, so the spring is still gonna be larger than the gravitational force, so the acceleration would still be upward. It would just be smaller than it was originally. So what we might do is we might annotate that this acceleration is large, whereas this acceleration is small. When we get back to equilibrium, that's where the forces are balanced, so that's why the acceleration at that point is gonna be zero. And then above equilibrium, the gravitational force is larger, so the net force will be down, so the acceleration is going to be down. So the first thing we have to do is divorce ourselves from the common misconception 
that velocity and acceleration have to have the same sign or be in the same direction. That's not true. Remember that the acceleration is the change in velocity. So if the velocity were zero and the acceleration were also zero, then the thing would never move. It would just sit there. So this thing is momentarily at rest, but the forces on it are exerted upward, so the velocity is going to be changing in the upward direction. So that's the first misconception that we have to address, that these things are going to be in the same direction. They're not. If both of these were zero, then the thing would never be moving. That would be boring. Okay, so let's look now at the second page. The first thing that we need to do is remember the shapes of the trig function graphs that we learned. Remember that a sine function starts at zero. Remember that a cosine function starts at a positive maxima. A negative cosine function would just start at a minimum or negative maximum. So what do you guys need to be able to do with those? You need to be able to look at a graph and decide which one is applicable. Is it a sine, is it a cosine, or is it a negative cosine? So if we look down below at the graph in number two, that shows the height of an object as it oscillates in simple harmonic motion. All we have to do is go, this thing is starting at a negative three meter centimeters whatever this unit is. Um, and so it is a negative cosine function. We know that because it starts at a minimum. It starts below the x-axis. Um, looking at the actual amplitude, let's just say that these are meters. That distance there is the amplitude. We're going to write down that it is 3 meters. Yes, it's negative in this situation, but the amplitude is just the positive of that. This distance right here is also equal to the amplitude. It's symmetrical about the x-axis. So the amplitude is 3 meters. The period is the time needed to complete one cycle. So if we look over here, this is the t or time axis. So all we have to do is figure out the time that it takes to go from negative 3 meters back to negative 3 meters. So this distance right here, that's not a distance, it's a time, is telling me the period. So if we look up here, that's occurring after 4 seconds. So the period is just 4 seconds. To get the frequency, I simply do 1 over the period. So basically the period and the frequency are inverses or reciprocals of each other. So that would be 1 over 4 seconds. You could write that as 0.25 if you wanted to, or 1 fourth, doesn't matter. The unit would be 1 over second, and you might just leave it as 1 over second. You could also say that that is 0 0.25 hertz. Zero point two five hertz. So that's the important information that we can glean from that graph. We can figure out the amplitude, we can figure out the period, from the period we can figure out the frequency and vice versa, um, and then we can kind of tell what function it is. Here it's a negative cosine. So when I write out the equation, I'm just going to start by writing y my amplitude was 3 meters. Go ahead and plug in the unit for the amplitude because it could be centimeters or feet or something else. It's a negative cosine function, so I'm going to say cosine. Let's go ahead and put the minus sign out front like we learned in algebra. And then the stuff in parentheses is simply 2 pi f times t. So let's put in two pi. The frequency is 0.25 hertz. I'm gonna write one over seconds. 
because when you multiply that by the variable t, seconds times seconds will cancels out, cancels out, giving you just radians on the inside of your parentheses. So to simplify that, all we need to do is just multiply these two numbers right here. So that'd be y equals negative three meters cosine, two times 0.25 would be 0.5, pi and then t. Pi is just pi. If you wanted to multiply that and get a decimal, you could. I would just leave it as pi. And then t is the variable. So t just stays as t. Kind of takes the place of x in the normal y equals mx plus b format. So there is the equation for motion for the simple harmonic oscillator figured out in that graph. The basic form of the equation um, y equals a cosine 2 pi f t is actually on your physics 1 formula chart. So you don't have to remember what goes where. All you got to be able to do is go, is it a sine or a cosine function, fill in the amplitude, fill in the frequency, and then simplify it if you need to. That's on your formula chart. Just remember that anywhere there's a sine on the formula chart, it could also be a cosine. Okay, so let's flip the page. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to try to understand um, what the graph tells us about the position, the acceleration, the velocity, and the force on the actual object itself. So we're going to be kind of switching back and forth between um, our two graphs. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to put a big X every time the object returns to its original position. So its original position is negative 3 meters. There's negative three meters again. There's negative three meters again. There's negative three meters again. So the graph covers 12 seconds and it covers four complete oscillations where it goes from negative three meters back to negative three meters. The next thing we're gonna do, we're gonna put a big square every time it has its greatest positive velocity. So there's two ways we can think about this. One, it's got its greatest velocity when it is at equilibrium, which is zero. So I'm going to go ahead and note x naught for equilibrium. Actually, let's do y naught since we call this vertical oscillator. Um, and so it's going to have its greatest velocity at one second, three second, five seconds, seven second, nine seconds, and 11 seconds. The thing that we have to realize is it's asking us for the greatest positive velocity, so when it's moving upward. So we have to think, all right, it's moving upwards between zero seconds and two seconds. Two seconds is when it reverses and it starts to come back down. So at one second, doing a big square, it's got its greatest velocity and it's moving upwards. But at three seconds, it's got its greatest velocity but moving downwards. We're going from big positions to small positions. Five seconds, we're back to equilibrium and we're moving upwards. Same thing with nine seconds. So there's three points, three times, one, five, and nine seconds, where the object has its greatest positive velocity. The other times at equilibrium, we're moving downwards, and so we're going to do a triangle for those. Same at seven seconds and same at 11 seconds. So we can say definitively we know that the object is going to be moving the fastest when it's at equilibrium. The next thing we have to do is consider the direction. Is it moving up or is it moving down? The other way to remember this, or to think about it rather, is the velocity is the slope of the position time graph. If you look right here at one second, you've got a big positive slope, whereas at negative, or excuse me, three seconds, you've got a big negative slope. One second, the line's got a big positive slope, but at negative or at three seconds, it's got a big negative slope, kind of like that. So, two ways to kind of think about that. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to write a plus a max every time the acceleration has the the object rather has the greatest positive acceleration. So here's where looking back at our free body diagrams might help us out. The acceleration is related to the force, so when is the force the greatest? The force is the greatest when the displacement is the greatest. 
to when it's at its most lowest point or down there at the bottom at its highest point. The next thing we have to remember is the direction of the acceleration is going to be in the direction of the net force. So when it's at its lowest position, that's when it's got the biggest positive force. So that's when it's going to have the biggest positive acceleration. It's kind of switching back to our graph. At three, or excuse me, at zero seconds, it's at its lowest position. So that's when it's going to have its greatest maximum acceleration. So let's write plus a max at zero seconds. Same thing at four seconds. Positive maximum acceleration. Same thing at eight seconds. So when we've displaced it down by its greatest amount, that's when it's going to want to go up the most. That's when it's going to have its greatest upwards or positive acceleration. The reverse is going to be true. The greatest negative acceleration is going to be when it's at its highest point. So that would be at two seconds, I'm going to say negative a max, at six seconds, negative a max, and then again at ten seconds. So when you think about acceleration, remember that you are thinking about the forces. So that's where your free body diagrams will help you understand what is happening. Okay. Let's move on to the last page. Look at question number four. So question number four, what is true of the position when the object has zero acceleration? So zero acceleration is going to occur when the forces are balanced. Go back to our graph. And our forces are going to be balanced when the object is at equilibrium. So when it's at equilibrium, that's when the forces are balanced. Go back to our free body diagrams again. Equilibrium, the forces are balanced. So that's when it's going to have a acceleration of zero. The object has zero velocity when it's displaced the most. That's when the acceleration is the biggest. And so at maximum displacement, that's when the object is going to be stopping before it turns around and goes back towards equilibrium again. So the next part, I'm going to kind of do separately, um, is for students mainly who are going to take Physics C next year. It's a little bit more on understanding the math behind the graph. We're going to translate this to a velocity time graph. So that's optional as to whether or not you want to do it with me. You definitely need to do the individual practice part, and we'll kind of check that in class. Until then, ta-ta.